Success Insight shares the stories of the people with passion and drive who make things happen in the world. Here's your host, Howard Fox. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Success Insight podcast. Our guest today is Holly A. Sharp. Holly is the author of the Dream It and Do It book series. Now, the Dream It and Do It series is the winner of the five out of five star Reader's Favorite Award. Congratulations there. And a little more about Dream It and Do It. It was inspired by Holly's desire to introduce children to a wide range of career possibilities at a young age. The series expands children's interests by using bedtime stories about real and modern people to make learning about the future fun. Holly, welcome to the Success Inside Podcast. Thanks so much for having me. Fantastic. Now, I would love, you know, for our listeners, if you could provide just a little context about your background and what was this aha moment that I'm going to have a book series? I want to write a book or a series of books. So tell us a little bit about that. I am a first time author. So this was not something that, you know, I went to school and studied to be. There was definitely an aha moment. I spent my career, so last 15 years, in new product development for various Fortune 500 companies and for startups both here and in China. And about a year ago, I found myself eight months pregnant and without a job. As I was preparing to have a baby and for my various baby showers, I was being asked by my moms and sisters and girlfriends what kind of books I wanted to fill my baby's library with. And I was looking for things about feminism, about diversity, about bullying, and about possible like career choices. And I know that like having not even a baby born yet, like it already shows you how type A I am, (laughs) that I was looking for that kind of book. But as I searched, I found some wonderful books that were about specific careers. So like Iggy Pack, a lot of really great biography type books, like Rebel Girls and uh, like the Who, Who Is series. But what I really was trying to find was something that put together in an organized way the rainbow of possibilities that kids have that they may not be exposed to at a young age. So if, you know, like our daughter, my husband and I both study business, but there's certainly a lot more things that she could do. So given my experience in new product development, I kind of know what that tingle in my tummy feels like when I feel like I'm onto something that might be missing from the marketplace. So I sat down during the last two months of my pregnancy and kind of plotted out what would this look like? Can I actually do this? Does this make any sense? And then when COVID hit, I kind of thought, what a great opportunity to actually bring this thing to life. And so that's how I've spent the last year is writing this thing. And then I launched it around Thanksgiving. Sounds like a fantastic journey. And I really have to admire, I mean, you're really on the last months of the pregnancy and thinking about these kinds of topics. And Just given your background in the product development, sounds like you may have come across artistic roles, helper, uh, discovery roles, business development roles. And how did you start to settle on those topics for the book? So you've got, there are three books in the series for our listeners. There's Artistic Role Models for Boys and Girls. That's volume one, and that's made out of up of 29 stories the helper and discovery role models. And that's made up of 40 stories in business and product development, uh, which is right up your alley, 31 stories. How did those three topics come about for you? How did you settle in on those? It really started with the people. And that was what was most important to me. During the last two months of my pregnancy, where frankly, I wasn't doing much anyways, I did a ton of research about all of the different documentaries and autobiographies and talks that people had given over the last five years, because it was really important to me that as I did my research, that I got to know this person in their own words. I tried to avoid anything written about them. So biographies versus autobiographies. And I really wanted to hear who they were in their own voice. So I just started collecting lists of people who had told their story. And then as I you know, was narrowing that list, it was also important to me that they were modern. So you know, obviously what a photographer looks like today is different than what a photographer would have looked like in the 50s, right? Then as I made sure that, you know, okay, everyone on this list is someone who is around today, or at least like is, is part of our modern history, 
The final thing I made sure was that this was a, a diverse book. It was really important to me that all sorts of kids could see themselves in this book. And so as I used those different ways of narrowing, the list kind of made itself. And then because of my bit of a type A personality, I didn't feel like enough to me to just tell a hundred stories. I felt like I needed to put them in some sort of collected orders so that, you know, kids could see like, Hey, maybe, you know, I feel artistic and I love all of these different ways of bringing my creativity to life. So I wanted kids who are interested in like, the creative type of jobs or the scientific type of jobs to be able to kind of narrow in on who their role models might be. And when you started to craft the outline and the structure for these books, was there a kind of a, a template or a pattern for those? And I asked this because before we actually started the podcast, you had mentioned you'd, you'd listened to a couple episodes and it probably will take two or three episodes to realize that the framework is fairly straightforward. You know, there's an introduction, there's the body, and then there's this ending that invites the listeners to learn more about my guest and especially the, the children's book authors, et cetera, or authors in general, et cetera. What was the structure for each one of the stories about the role model? Yeah, this this took a couple of stories to kind of get into the groove. And I worked with my editor pretty closely on this. And where I kind of bet it out in terms of a structure, and now that I look back, I'm I'm very happy we ended up here, is the story, each story starts by explaining what the profession is. Some of them are pretty self-explanatory, like what's a photographer? But you know, ask someone to explain to you what an astrophysicist does or what a material engineer does. And I think you'll find that's a little bit harder to do. So every story starts with a very, very basic explanation of what it means to do this job. And then what my editor referred to as fables is kind of how she likes to think about my stories because they, you know, take each role model and really bring to life what their childhood is like. And I would say, you know, almost every single story kind of starts with their childhood and talks about how the person use their childhood or what they were interested in or the influences that they have to become the person that they were today. And most of the time I talk a little bit about like what they do today and usually in, in a story format of something that happened to them that made them good at their job or that made them particularly successful. And then um, each one ends with an invitation for children to go do something, so to take some action. So um, what are things that you know you don't have to wait to be a grown up to do? And for me as a new mom, this was something that I think is really cool where I had these daydreams of, you know, Ronnie, my daughter, getting older and you know, being bored on a Saturday afternoon and saying, you know what? go grab the book and pick a story and we're going to go do the activity. And already there's been influencers on Instagram that have, have gotten the book and they've had their kids do activities, whether it's, you know, putting the face of their kid on someone who does that profession or another influencer was interested in the landscaping story. So they did, they took out the Play-Doh and then made this huge landscape. It's really cool to me to not just read the story, but invite kids to do something with it and, and figure out if this is something that I'm interested in. You know, I love this idea of really being a part of the story. So as you just said, go beyond the words, but then act on the story itself by participating in these activities. Now, let's talk about the, 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 the three books, the series. Talk more in depth about the, the artistic role models. That's volume number one in, in the series. There's, there's 29 stories, short stories. Tell us a little bit more about that. And was there a particular role model that, you know, when you were writing this particular a volume, it's like, okay, I have to include this individual because they meant so much to me or, you know, that they meant so much to somebody that, that I know. And so tell us more about that. Ooh, that's, that is a really hard one to answer because they're all like my little babies. But I think I'll give two answers if you don't mind. I think there's one that when I first started writing, I had heard about her and she's, I wouldn't say particularly famous, which in you know this particular book does have a lot of famous people in it just by nature of being you know, performers and writers and designers. Um, but I thought it was really a really cool reflection of how, you know, 
careers that exist today will look different for the next generation of dreamers or, or frankly, doers. So there's a story in here about a woman who's a journalist. Her name is Nani, and she tells the news, but it occurred to her that a lot of the stories that she was telling weren't getting enough attention despite how important they were. So she started creating a virtual reality version of the news. And her story is basically about her very first story she did this with. And she was interested in helping bring more attention to food banks. And she'd heard a story in her neighborhood of a gentleman who'd gone to the food bank and was standing in line and was so hungry, but there wasn't enough food. And he ended up passing out and the ambulance came and it was a very moving story. But you know, in written word, she found that it kept getting buried wherever the story was trying to be told. So she created this virtual reality where people could be standing in line and hearing the commotion and, and seeing the man fall. And I really like, it really struck me as like, this is what news is going to be like for the kids reading this book. And I thought it was a really cool story to tell in terms of what the future of journalism looks like. So I really tried hard to pick people like that, that can help kids understand how their role today is going to be so important 10 years from now. But the more selfish one is Kristen Chenoweth. I have been a massive fan of hers. I'm a huge, huge Broadway fan. So when I thought that I was going to get the opportunity to write this book, she was definitely one of the first people that I couldn't wait to get my hands on her autobiography. I've had a chance to talk with her people, which was kind of cool. I, probably two weeks before I was laid off, I actually was seven and a half months pregnant. She did a two night show in New York and I bought tickets the day before, hopped on a plane uh, and went out there to see her show. I, I love her so much. And I'm so happy about the fact that she loves working with kids and she does a lot to help budding Broadway stars. So I knew that she would also be excited to be a part of this book. So I was very glad that she uh, agreed to come on board. Fantastic. And is she since read the book and, and, and her particular story? I haven't heard back from her yet. I hope that she has. So if for some crazy reason she's listening, I would love to hear what she thinks about it. But she has read her story and I know she was a big fan of what I wrote. So hopefully she is out there reading more of them. Fantastic. And now that we've kind of laid the groundwork uh, in volume one, let's talk about volume two, the helper and discovery role models. Who are, there's 40 stories here. Uh, by the way, how long are the stories? Is there, is it, two to three pages, four pages? What, what's the approximate length? Yeah, so each one is uh, about a page and a half. So each each story has its own illustration and none of them go over two, two pages. So it's a, about a 200 page book when, in the collection where they're all together. But yeah, about a page and a half. Okay. And what are a couple stories there that, that jump out for you? There's two women who were one of the first firefighters in New York City. And I think it's a cool story to tell because I want both girls and boys to be inspired by this book. But I think it's it's great for boys to see themselves in jobs that aren't necessarily always for boys and for girls to see themselves in jobs that aren't necessarily always for girls. And so I think their story uh, was really inspiring in terms of what they did to kind of break through what was traditionally a very male dominated industry. And I've had the chance to talk to both women and they're, they're such lovely people that it was a real honor to be able to write about them and feature their story. Very good. You know, it's interesting as you are just describing that and the juxtaposition of a woman talking about being in a what would be considered a male dominated field and vice versa, a man being in a what would be traditionally a female dominated field. I'm, I have a, uh, a friend of mine actually back in Chicago and his son, he has two sons, very accomplished. The one in particular was a second string center on the DePaul Blue Demons basketball team. And he was also going back to school to become a nurse. In fact, a an emergency room nurse. So he's he actually, you know, had a COVID twice this year, but he's since recovered. But I'm thinking, I mean, those are the types of role models that we need, people who are doing things and 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 also breaking barriers. And now we have Kamala Harris, who's the, the vice president elect of the United States, and talk about a, a role model for young girls. 
Yeah, I really, I mean, I spent a lot of time and thought of, um, and I, like I said, like, I think the most important thing I did was figure out who the people were. And then once I figured out the people, then the rest kind of fell into place because it was really important to me that this was a book for both boys and girls where they could see themselves in an, in non-stereotypical ways. So um, I really did enjoy writing that story where I think women firefighters is such a, a cool thing to me. Very good. So let's talk about the volume three, which is business and product development. That's like right up your alley, as a matter of fact. <laughs> what stories kind of jumped out for you? I mean, I know they're all special. They're your babies, but <laughs> is there one or two that jump out for you? Yeah. So within the business, so I, I called it the lemonade stand because I think for kids that business can be a little bit harder to understand. So at the beginning of the business section, I actually try to lay out like what are the parts of a lemonade stand and what, how does each person, how are they responsible for making a lemonade stand work? Um, my husband's favorite story in the whole book, and it's, I think, become one of mine, is the um, gentleman who wrote Undercover Economist. And you know, when I think about jobs that kids don't have a clue exist, um, this is one of those to me. So like, you know, if you survey 100 kids, how many know and understand what an economist does. And it was fun to write because when you really boil down what an economist does, I was able to, you know, think about it as being a money detective. Like they really follow the trail of money and understand why people do what they do when it comes to the exchange of goods and services. And so I talk a little bit about how, you know, Disney World, how they choose to set their pricing based on who's attending and from where they're coming from. The other thing I talk about is his love of game theory. So when he was a young, when he was younger, he discovered game theory and that really led him to becoming an economist. And I use prison, the prisoner's dilemma to basically explain what happens when you're telling on your sibling. So both of you have a story to tell. How does it actually work if prisoner's dilemma, when prisoner's dilemma and game theory come into play and your parents are deciding who to believe and who gets in trouble? So I, I have enjoyed the process of trying to take things that are hard harder for kids to understand and, and boiling them down in, into simple, relatable things. So I, I have kind of an affection for that one. So it was probably the first time that my husband read what I was doing was like, you know what, there's, you're doing something that someone hasn't done before. This is special. So um, I, I do have affection for that story. Fantastic. You mentioned earlier, as you were writing these, these chapters that there were illustrations, how did the illustrations come about and what was it like working with an illustrator and bringing them on your team and helping to share your vision of what you wanted to convey? Sure. So I, I interviewed a couple of people and um, basically started with one person and had them bring their vision for, for this person to life. And what I realized really quickly was that I didn't want this to come across as a fairy tale book. So I felt like the pictures that came across as whimsical, either made the story seem like it was more of a picture book and for younger kids than I was intending, or that, you know, it made the person not feel real. And one of the things that's important to me in this book is that kids can see themselves in these characters and these real life people and these role models. So, you know, having, while there, they are illustrations, and I think my illustrator did a wonderful job, um, I do, I wanted it to feel like someone they could recognize um, so if they, you know, tried to learn more about the person, they would recognize them from their picture versus being a little bit more whimsical that maybe they it felt like an, a, a fairy tale character. So, you know, I hope that I found a good balance between being illustrated and making it, you know, appealing to kids, but by the same token, feeling a bit re more real so that kids felt more like they were role models than, you know, this princess off in our high off castle. Gotcha. And what was it like working with, a publisher, and, and I imagine you're working with some you know, the publicists and PR to get the word out. I mean, it's it's tough these days with, because of COVID and what we can and cannot do. But what was it like working with uh, having a, a team there to support you and to kind of keep the the ball rolling, so to speak, to to make sure you're you're on target, you're accomplishing what you set out to accomplish any given day, you know, to produce these works? What was it like? So the book is being self-published. So uh, every person that contributed to this book, I personally hired. It was a huge learning lesson. And um, I think, frankly, I, I made some really great choices in, 
and the partners that I brought on. And so I think that frankly, the hardest thing was that when I started writing this book, my daughter was three weeks old. So I've been doing this for the last seven months alongside of raising her. So that's probably one of the, the biggest challenge has just been having the discipline to really use nap time as, as well as I could every single day. And then after the book was finished, I hired two women who are absolutely fantastic to help me with the publicity and they've done a wonderful job. So, um, you know, being new to the industry, I know quite a bit about product development and how to launch products, but um, they really helped me teach teach me a little bit more about how the, the book industry works. So this year has been a huge learning curve in terms of the industry, but I do believe I've, I've connected with a lot of absolutely wonderful people. Very good. Now, I would imagine none of these books have been published. They're available. There's programming around them. You've got the website and we'll get your uh, the URL to your website shortly. What has been the lessons learned for Holly A. Sharp about this entire journey? What have you learned about yourself? So I think the biggest thing that I've learned is that you can do so much if you commit yourself to turning off the TV. And I had a lot of people ask me, you know, how do you write a book and have um, a newborn at the same time? And to be honest, I would have never in a million years thought that this was possible. I think, frankly, a lot of people around me probably thought the like, good, she'll have something to keep her busy. And then when the world turns back on, then, you know, she'll go back to doing what she's done before. And, you know, while we were unable to see friends and family, I made a promise to myself that I wouldn't turn on the TV for pleasure, or I wouldn't watch a, a series TV show until the book was finished. So I would watch a lot of documentaries, or I would maybe watch a movie because I knew like, all right, an hour and a half after I start it, it will be over and there's no more commitment. So it was probably six weeks ago when I finally got to watch Mrs. America, which I've been dying to watch. I really forced myself to use the free time that I had to commit to this book. And I, I really do love biographies and, and documentaries. So it didn't feel like work. And it, it was an, an easier thing to do in between nap times. And while I was going for walks, I could listen to audiobooks. So I, I think, you know, what I really took away was it like, I don't know if it gets harder than this, but if I can write a hundred stories while my baby is six months, like two to eight months, then I probably can do something else if I just commit myself to doing it. Very good. And speaking of something else, you know, your life has changed in, in a number of ways. I mean, you know, you now have a beautiful baby, you're a multi-book published author, for, uh, or an award-winning author for that matter. The job situation has changed. What do you see the future looking like for you? Honestly, I would love nothing more than to write future books that have different angles about how what kids can become. Um, I love the idea of being able to juggle motherhood and writing, and I think I've proven to myself that I can do it. I have a, a next book in my head already. I want to write a book with 50 kids that have done exceptional things before high school graduation um, to really give kids role models that are even closer to the age they can relate to. So uh, ideally, I would be able to spend the next three, four months writing the next book and uh, continuing to inspire kids, figure out what they want to be when they grow up. Fantastic. You know, when you are ready to embark on that journey for that next book, uh, I'd love to introduce you to a young lady. I cannot remember her last name, but her first name is Chloe. She wrote a book uh, of poetry and is writing her first novel. And she's, I, I think if I remember correctly, she's probably like 12 or 13 years old right now. And isn't it just exceptional when you hear stories like that? The, like it, you just realize that, you know, kids have it in them. It just takes helping them figure out what those interests are or how to inspire them. So I would absolutely love um, to meet what sounds like a pretty exceptional little girl. I will definitely uh, make that happen for you. So Holly, in, in the time we have left, is there any other insights or ahas or, you know, just, you know, God, I would love to share this with the, with the uh, listening audience about this journey you've been on to produce these books, the topics, anything in particular you'd like to share with us? 
Yeah, there's a really interesting book called The Childhood Roots of Happiness. And you know, one of the things that I think as we talk about what kids want to be, that you know, maybe it's the generation that I'm from, but to me, success is tied in so closely to happiness that I don't ever want my book to come across as, you know, every kid needs to know who they're going to be at 12 years old. But in this book, the psychiatrist that wrote it talks a lot about how, you know, the finding something that you're interested in and acquiring the discipline to become good at it is something that no one can take away from you in adulthood. When it comes to having discipline rooted inside of you, that is something that's hard to teach yourself as an adult. So if you can learn it as a kid, you are actually more likely to be happy as an adult because not only do you have the discipline to learn something and be good at it, but you're more likely to be able to dodge the bullets that come at you just in general life. So, you know, I think understanding what you love and what you're good at isn't just a matter of like, oh, I want my kid to grow up and make money, but it actually increases the the likelihood that your your child is going to be happy if they can find something and then actually use discipline and practice to get good at it. And it, it really can make a huge difference in their life. So that to me is what this book is all about more than just, you know, quote unquote success. You know, it, as you were just describing that insight, I was reminded of, uh, and I can't rem- can't remember his name, Mike Rowe, and I know he had a couple shows up on cable, and one of his initiatives is helping individuals who don't want to go to college to get that four year degree, but also but to pursue careers in in the trades, you know, whether it's electrical, plumbing, you know, what what you know, oil and gas, whatever. Because we don't all have, to, we can have a passion, but it, and actually make a very good living at it and be very happy. Because I believe, as a coach, we should be happy in our careers and not feel like we're doing this as drudgery day after day. But we should be working and be happy at the same time. And I think, yeah, I would imagine there's a huge series out there for young kids, hopefully with parents who are supportive at the same time, to pursue something that maybe is, in this day and age, non-traditional, because you don't have to go to school and get that four-year degree to be happy. Yeah, and I I really try to make that part of this book as well. So you'll find in here that there's welders, there's builders, there's people that work on uh, public works. So I tried really to think about not just jobs that require a four or frankly, six year degree and include other careers that where kids can work with their hands. Cause I, I completely agree with you that, and frankly, like being a welder today, you can probably make more than someone who has an MBA. So I think that, you know, teaching kids that being good at something and learning and and driving using that to drive your happiness is as important as what you the education that you get to do it. Fantastic. So Holly, if our listeners would like to learn more about you and your work, where are the best places for them to go? So you can find me on Facebook and Instagram and my website is uh, dreamitanddoit.com and I'll just call out the end because I <laughs> realize that I I published my website literally the night before I went in to um, have a C-section. So this passed me by a little bit, but the end of the website is, uh, it's dreamit, A-N-D-O-I-T.com. So you might be inclined to put in the two Ds. You'll probably find it eventually anyways, but it's dreamit and O-I-T.com. Dream it and ooh it. Okay, I got that. Well, yes. we'll, we will most definitely provide the, the link to make it easy for our listeners to get access to your website. And, you know, and, and I would imagine the website was probably not the first thing on your mind as you're like getting ready to go into labor, you know? <laughs> yeah, so, and, and once I had it, you know, I actually kind of thought it was funny and it hasn't really been a problem, but yeah, so I, I appreciate the extra help to get your listeners there. Fantastic. And we will also provide the uh, links back to your Facebook and Instagram pages as well. Holly, thank you so much for joining us on the Success Insight podcast. And, you know, it's been a great conversation with you and we wish you much success with your current series of books and looking forward to the new possibilities going forward. I appreciate it. It was a pleasure. Thanks so much. All right. Okay, folks, we've just been chatting with Holly A. Sharp. Holly's the author of the Dream It and Do It book series. 
And just a reminder, the Dream in a Book series is the winner of five out of five readers' favorite award. And in a, the idea and premise behind the series is was inspired by the desire to introduce children to a wide range of career possibilities at a young age. And through these series, these three volumes, you know, such wonderful opportunities to learn about role models who are perhaps pursuing both traditional and non-traditional careers in the artistic realm, the helper and discovery role models, as well as business and product development. So do go out to Holly's website, dreamitanddoit.com. Again, we'll provide the backlinks. And we're also going to provide the backlinks to Holly's author page on Amazon, as well as to her Facebook and Instagram sites as well. Okay, we hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Do let us know what you think by giving us some comments. Please visit us on successinsightpodcast.com. We are also on LinkedIn and on Facebook at our link uh, Success Insight podcast pages. Uh, you can also find us on most of the podcast platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Pandora, iHeartRadio, and Amazon Music. And you can also find us on YouTube as well. All right, folks, go out there, have a phenomenal day. We are still in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, so be safe, wear your mask, practice social distancing, take care of yourselves, be mindful of the community that you are around, and just practice that, that safe distancing, okay? We'll see you on the next episode of the Success Insight Podcast. Take care now. Success Insight is a production of Fox Coaching and First Story Strategies. Find us online, successinsightpodcast.com.